you are back. Which means we'll have technical difficulties. Probably. <laughs> um, how was your birthday? It was fun. Spent it with family. Can't complain. So. Okay. Drank cookie dough whiskey. Cookie dough whiskey. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Like We're not whiskey. drinking today. I forgot to get water. Damn it. That's all right. right. Um, we won't be too long. <laughs> so, um, you know, on the, on the car ride here, we're talking about going to Indiana in two weeks to actually teach our plain clothes survival tactics class, right? When we started teaching it, actually just to give the pe people a little bit of history, when you and I met. Yeah, and, in uh, the early days. Early days. And then you came to my office one day and you said, BK, zip tie me, which I did. And you got out of it. Well, and, and obviously there's more background. No, no, I think that was pretty much it. <laughs> well, I'm talking about what led to that moment. Um, at the time, I was working, I was actively working um, undercover operations for a certain federal agency. Um, and I had graduated from a state and then a federal, very thorough, phenomenal schools. Um, but we, I brought to you some of the gaps that I felt and after actually actively working undercover work, which is very stressful mentally and physically, um, you know, statistically speaking, an undercover officer, and I'm not talking about playing clothes and stuff like that, has a 60% more chance of death or serious injury in, oh, their, really? in their line of work. Yes. Um, not to, and that's not even counting the physical stress, the mental stress and things right. like that, that you end up dealing with. Um, and for those who are not police officers and stuff like that, you know, one of the things I realized, and I'll talk about it, um, the tactics that we show apply to the everyday person as well um, in certain right. parts and, of their life. And, and although we don't teach all of those skills, no, some of them we, we teach to civilians and we frame it in home invasion defense, right? right. We get tied up to, you know, right. And, and, and that brings me to the point of uh, why do we have to teach this, right? Um, at some point, the bad guy wants something, right? Um, whether you're whether you're a police officer or not, you know, we talk about home invasions, crimes, et cetera, they're gonna rob something because they know you have something. In law enforcement, you're trying to obtain some kind of, you know, object, product, whatever it may be, whether it's information, you know, counterproliferations, human trafficking, drugs, et cetera, firearms. So they know you have to give them something. 99.9% mm -hmm. .9 of the time it's what? It's money, right? Yep. Um, and that is the point of whether things are going to break bad or not. I forgot my fidget ball. Sorry. Oh, well. Remember, I got a squeeze. I, I do. Yeah. Stop That's hitting fine. the table, just, though. Just keep hitting <laughs> um, So one of the things in the school was uh, we, we learned a lot of administrative stuff, how to handle CIs, blah, blah, blah. But we never learned. They, we talked about, yeah, you can get robbed. You can get kidnapped. You can get tied up. But never once were we taught how to avoid those situations, how to get out of those situations. And if we ended up, being abducted or whatever it is, what do we do from there? Good. And that's why. Yeah, and I will say, I mean, having done undercover work uh, on the military side um, pretty extensively, a lot of what we did was, I guess because it was military, um, was that just one persona, obviously, saw you kind of blend in with the local population and so forth. But there wasn't a true zero component in the sense that you're talking about, right? We had the military zero class. Right, you right, fall right. top team. What did you do to right. maintain your your mental uh, right. acuity and and you know what you should and shouldn't do? But nobody taught me how to get out of handcuffs until you came to my office <laughs> and said, "BK, put me in zip ties," and then he said, "Put me in handcuffs," and then it got king here from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll save that for another podcast. Um, and it, and it's unfortunate because there's this. We see it time and time again. When we train professionals all over the country. They, they, police officers are giving a, a, a generic across the board training. Right, we got to hit the check marks. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, when it comes to defensive tactics, firearms, and stuff like that, it's general across the board. You know, and we've said it time and time again. Whether you're a homicide detective, uh, you know, a uh, narcotics officer, tactical operations, everyone should have a specific set of defensive tactics, firearms trainings that's yeah. geared towards the, that specific. Just events are more likely to happen. Your right. tools are going to be different. And for the most part, some agencies do, um, but I think we see it lacking big time as, when it comes to plain clothes and undercover work. Yeah. You know, tactical operations, tactical operations, you're obviously going to get the specialized training, but you don't see that. In undercover operations and playing close operations. Right. So you came to me with that idea and I loved it. So we developed a curriculum. And initially, 
we did frame it in undercover work, but then what we found out pretty quickly is these skills should probably be taught to every officer because even an off duty officer right. that's in plain clothes may be caught. Yeah, when you're off duty, you're a plain clothes peace officer. Yep. <laughs> you're still a police officer and you still be targeted may still be targeted for being a police Which officer. Which is more prevalent now. And and for me always the biggest thing is when you teach officers how to get out of handcuffs and they realize how simple it is. Right. And now when they are doing the patrol duties or whatnot, next time they are putting handcuffs on another individual they'll have a higher level of respect and understanding of, okay, just because I put that restraint on that individual doesn't mean I'm actually controlling that individual. And that enhances significantly, I believe, officer safety. Because if I put an handcuffs on you and just one of those, put and forget, right? right? Then I'm putting myself at risk. Um, It's one of the reasons I used to show it to, I used to um, assist with the Citizens Police Academy. And a lot of them were, you know, community, uh, community, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Oh, I just brain farted. I'm tired. But they were advocates for, you know, progression and stuff like that, which I'm all about. I'm all, you know me. I'm all about progression, changing what needs to be changed, et cetera, doing the job better. Um, but one of the things I wanted them to realize, because there's always an issue when it comes to a handcuffed assailant, right? Oh, he was handcuffed. You can't do this. He was handcuffed. You can't do that. And I wanted to show them that just because they're handcuffed does not mean that they're no longer a threat, that we can right. completely ignore the fact that, you know, just because there's this restraint on them, you know, we can ignore the fact that they're not in danger anymore. They still are. Um, I mean, on average, I can open a handcuff now within 30 seconds, you know, yep. double locked with a bobby pin, you know. Two Heck, our, our students by the end of a two hour block can do that. Yes. It's amazing. How and simple. and, and the criminal element knows how to do these skills. Well, that's and okay. that's what I was going to say. I learned it from a criminal, someone in the criminal element. I didn't learn this from a professional. I learned it from a criminal who was willing to share the knowledge, you know? Right. Um, And I like to make that known to everyone. Like, just because they're in handcuffs doesn't mean it's over. Yeah. And and aside for Sear, one one point I'd like to bring up. So um, I had to testify on behalf of a sheriff deputy that was working in a correctional facility and he got reprimanded and removed from his job for hitting an inmate that was placed in handcuffs. But the, throughout the process, obviously, that inmate was very combative. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he, while in handcuffs, ended up hitting another deputy and breaking their foot or leg or something. And then he was being still resistant with this one deputy. And the deputy ended up doing palm hill strike essentially to distract the individual so he can gain control they were in a fight just because the guy was in handcuffs doesn't mean that they can't fight you right and when we teach this here class it's you know we bind the officers and we tell them listen if you need to fight you can still fight while being handcuffed oh yeah absolutely but, but again opening the eyes to both sides of the equation right. it's pretty interesting you still have to be smart about your tactics how you control an individual yep. i get that but the simple fact that just because they're restrained does not mean that the threat is over or the fight is over. There's still a potential for that. Right. And then reciprocating that when we restrain our students, we're telling them it's not over. Yep. You can get out of this. Out of everything. Yeah. And and they look at you with big eyes and say, can I? But then 10 minutes later from the worst, not even I'm exaggerating with 10 minutes. I don't think it ever taken that long. But the worst case scenario, it looks like. I don't know, a horror porn or something, <laughs> the positions we put them in. Yes. And they, as long as they maintain their cool, they'll be out of it. I, I love seeing their anxiety yep. when we're tying them up. And more so, not even the ones being tied up, because they don't have a choice, right? We're tying them up. But the students that are watching, and they're like, oh, crap, I'm next. There's no way they're getting out of that. There's no way. And then their eyes are just wide open. Right. You know, after they're out on, in under a minute, you know, when you just stay calm, cool, collective, compartmentalize, and attack the problems. <laughs> They're like, holy crap, I can't believe I did that. I love the guy in the last class that hid my uh, trauma shears in his shoe shoe. and was able to pull it out and use that against zip ties and rope and whatnot. It was pretty (laughs) cool. Uh, So we ended up going and developing a class. The four classes, about three days long, depending on the agency. And it includes a bunch of elements. So yes. let's uh, let's explain to our listeners some of the elements that we include in the class. We obviously talk about the fitting restraints. We start with duct tape and zip ties because those are commonly available. Yes. And then we go Most to handcuffs. Commonly, yep. And that's statistically speaking. So the whole class is based off of science, statistics, yeah, research we've done, and our empirical experiences that, you know, from doing the work we did. So defeating the restraints, most commonly used restraints and how to defeat them, which you already said it right. 
Yeah, we're talking about duct tape and zip duct ties. Duct tape, zip ties, yep. ropes, and handcuffs. So handcuffs are a little bit less available, but considering we teach it to law enforcement, they typically would bring a pair with them. Not necessarily UCs, but you know, the off-duty officer or the one that's doing just just a one-off type thing. They may have yeah, them. And then and I love the guy in the class who had the brand new Smith & Wessons with the advanced lock yeah, on it. You can't defeat this one. And then, <laughs> check this out. Click. Oops. Here you go. <laughs> um, and, then, and then we have a few more elements. We teach uh, defensive tactics in a very confined environment. So if these people are inside a car and all of a sudden the gun is pointing at them and they need to do something, they have the skills. Um, we, we actually put them in a car. Yeah, and I, we have them fight for a gun. And this goes back to traditional fighting. Whether, whatever you train, again, whether it's law enforcement defense, defensive tactics, military combatives, or traditional martial arts, I think one of the things that we really, really don't focus on what we do <laughs> at Masada um, is that really confined space, not close quarters fighting. Yep. Everybody does close quarters fighting, confined space it, fighting. It's amazing how when you talk to people about close quarters, they're like, oh, so you're talking about a building. I'm like, no, I'm talking about the trunk of a vehicle yes fine <laughs> space fighting the back seat of a car where you're using your shoulder as a striking tool you yep. know you're using whatever blunt object and the run. environment i mean we had to, i love the people that pin themselves against one door using the foot yes. to pin the opponent against the other yes, and, use your environment to your yep. advantage so they get defensive tactics uh i i say we do a driving component we don't teach them how to drive but again we put them in an environment that is most realistic because most most undercover, well, most operations in general, right? And even when we talk digging into protection and we teach about transitional zones between cars and buildings and vice versa, right? Most of our lives is in or around vehicles. Mm -hmm. So we teach them how to operate in that environment. Uh, we do shooting. Um, again, geared towards that plain clothes officer. So we teach instinctive shooting, but then we teach them to shoot through mediums such mm -hmm. as clothing or bags. Uh, wherever they may be concealing a firearm right. and may not have the time or the ability to present it, so they should. Um, again, close quarters, nobody's shooting through a pocket of a jacket 25 yards out, right? but they'll do it at two yards. Um, and then we do, um, we like taking the undercover or the plainclothes officer and putting them in a rescue component and taking a SWAT officer and putting them in a UC component just because so they have an appreciation to what the other team is going for. Because right. a lot of them, to your point, when you said that in class all the time, your SWAT guys may not know what you're going through. No, they don't. So putting them in that position and putting you as the undercover officer in the SWAT position, understand, okay, they may not have all the information that they need. No. It, it opens everybody's eyes. Yeah, and I remember, again, I mentioned this, we were training, our team was training our NARCs, and they do a phenomenal job teaching them SWAT tactics, mm -hmm. clearing tactics. And I was role-playing, and I remember being the UC sitting there saying, what the hell is taking them so long to get me out of this house? And, you know, we discussed it. You know, it's very kinetic. It's dynamic. It's a hostage dress. You're getting that person in and out. Um, even in situations actively working where I had to be, quote, unquote, rescued, um, I was tucked in a little ball waiting for those heavenly hands to grab me and pull me out. And what was actually maybe 10 to 15 seconds felt like an eternity. Right. You know, and all I hear is these SWAT commands, of, you know, <laughs> clear this, clear that. Fuck that. Get yeah. me the fuck out of here. You know where please. I'm at. Come get me. Uh, yeah. So we do a vehicle interdiction. So I had to get an officer out of a car. Um, there's a video that uh, you showed in the mm -hmm. last in Kentucky that we did uh where a rescue element came and actually shot the undercover officer just because misidentification fog yeah, of war the, that planning and planning is key yep so we talk about that we teach that um and then an element that you and i discussed earlier which you just alluded to is the officer rescue right since the old classes to your point there are other schools on the state mm -hmm. level and the federal level that teach the administrative side and the theory, but there's very few, if at all, that teach the practical side. Yeah, and, and, and again, we learn tactics, but they were very SWAT, you know, IBT, you know, right. like very IBT type tactics. And IBT is intuitive. Yeah, you call it integrated? We call it intuitive based. Sure, whatever. Tactics. Yeah, based, I know it's based tactics. <laughs> yeah, uh, interesting. No, but, but you're right. So our goal was, okay, we're going to take that one, gap that we haven't seen feel which was mm -hmm. what to do when things go out really bad and we teach that um so to that element we added an officer rescue we talked about it in the corner right here um 
were to teach SWAT officer how to get to that undercover uh, officer, how to rescue them without the need of clearing a house in the traditional way of thinking about it, and potentially medical uh, assistance yes. as needed, right? And then there should be the element of this is still an active crime scene, crime scene so understanding okay, how to manage that yep, at that point. Evidence preservation, et cetera, all that good stuff. Yep. So overall, this class, I mean, we taught it. We've been teaching for about 10 years now in different conferences yep. and people, I, I remember the beginning, people signed up not knowing what to expect. Yeah. And then by the second year is those class fill up within an hour because the yeah. word got out. It's pretty funny. It, and it's, it's validating and it, it's good to know that you're putting out good information that's saving lives, helping officers and giving them something that they haven't had. I mean, I think I, we had a lieutenant one time and he, even he, he was running a narcotics unit and he was like, holy crap. I don't do any of this with my guys. I need yep. to do this stuff with my guys. Right. They don't think about it. No, they don't right. because it's it's the worst case, right? Yep. But the potential is still there. You know, you're talking about 60% possibility of serious death or injury, you know, so you have to think outside the box. We right. stay too too focused on tradition. SWAT guys do SWAT stuff. Narcotics guys do narcotic stuff. There's a lot of crossover yeah, and, and a lot it's of great. Synonymous. You don't have to be on a SWAT team to learn SWAT tactics. That's always been our argument, right? right. I think every officer should learn specialized tactics. Yeah, the patrol officer responding to an active should at a school should know absolutely you know now if it becomes very dynamic yeah that's where your teams come in when it gets very specialized but everyone should learn those tactics to include um narcotics guys who are doing their own rescues a lot of the yep. time you know and again SWAT guys should be utilized in more ways than just you know having fancy expensive gear you know like we talked about utilizing snipers as overwatch for narcotics spies you right. know having SWAT guys in plain clothes in the area that can quickly jump out and respond, kind of like what you did in the military, right? Integrating those tactics. And we and do ideas. that in uh, in the scenario that we play right. at the end. It's pretty, it's pretty fun to see them. Okay, now we're thinking outside the box. Now mm -hmm. we're staging people right and we presetting for that. So that's great. And another thing we talk about in the class is how to assume a persona, right? Yes. I was part of the persona I'm playing. How can that aid me in either securing tools or allowing me to have that communication or the signals with people, right? right? Because I can I can play into the look of a hobo, right? Of a homeless individual buying drugs, right? I can hide so much stuff on them and have so many gestures built right. in. And you also use the example of uh, being a vet uh, that's down on his luck, right? And right. he's trying to buy uh, drugs. And how can you work different elements of, you see work into that persona right. you're building. And, and I always learned when, when I did it, it's easier to lie when you're when, telling the truth. Sure. Yep. Um, so, you know, all I had three personas primarily for the different cases that I worked in agencies I worked for. Um, the name I used was ver a family member mixed with my own person information, a birthday off one day. So I can always remember. And we talk about that in the class. Like you have to be able to spit this information out, yep. you know, where I was born, the city I was born, the hospital I was born in, just because it was coming up in casual you know, in conversation, right. they pick up on this stuff, yep. you know, criminals do this, you know, they're no dummies, uh, but hiding in plain sight and lying, telling the truth is probably the safest bet to go. And, yep. you know, like you said, one of the things was I was a vet down on my luck. You know, I wore dog tags, you know, I had military, you know, stuff all on me all the time, you know, so they didn't ever question it. Right. So, and you know, that goes in everyday life too. You know, you got, you got to have the gift of gab, or like I told you, the, the gift of lageria. Yep. You and know, you only have that. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Listen, that's just, well, besides all the anxiety that's built up and doing all this crazy stuff, but it's from that, you know, yep. being able to talk and talk and talk your way out of stuff. And and I'll be honest, when you talk about playing close and undercover tactics, that's a huge asset, being able to talk yourself out of situations. Oh, yeah. I, I had guns pointed at me. Yeah. You Building know, rapport. I, I just talked my way out of it. Yep. You know, like I never had to go kinetic, quote unquote, which is typically what police officers are taught, right? Oh, it's, I did last time. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's completely different in the UC world because right. you have to. It's crazy because you go into this work, and especially you see work, not thinking about yourself. You're thinking about the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, man, if I if I go kinetic now and compromise, this case is done. And right. Potential I would say to that, and, and I agree to 110%. I'm not uh, challenging any of that. But I think we got to a point at some point in training, and to your point again from earlier, 
where officers are too concerned about the big picture and forget the personal safety. Oh, absolutely. And that's where the planning comes in, right? right? And that's when I started taking a stand of like, nope, I don't want these guys as my backup. I want these guys as my backup. So I was more comfortable doing that because I knew the individuals in place were on point. They were the right people and they were going to be there when I needed them. Right. You know, so it goes that whole cycle, right? Now, before, hell no, it was self-preservation, especially when I started having a family and uh, like it's time to, you right. know. No, 100%. Yeah. Well, when I was doing undercover work, I was uh, in the military for the most part. So it wasn't, family was not an issue at the time. And right. we were young and, you know, invincible. Um, but I will say to your point about going to Kinetic, and I, I mentioned in the last few classes, is the last time. So when I did, when I do my police work here in America for my, not my recent agency, but the one prior, we, I did I did buys for them, right? Because mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not there enough for people to recognize right, me. That's perfect. Yeah, so I would come and I'll be an out-of-towner. Yeah. I speak funny. That's so how it should be. Agencies should be utilizing other people right. to use these. So I, w- I was there and the guy was flat out trying to rob me. Easy target. I'm not from around here. You know, he doesn't know yeah. me. I'm buying to buy drugs, so he's just going to rob me, right? And he pointed a gun at me. He was in the car with the gun, essentially at his lap, pointing through the door. Yeah. Right, I was outside, and and you know, we always tell say in the classes we don't teach you a technique, right? We teach you principles, because yeah. there's no technique that I know of to defend against a gun. Uh, when the person is inside the car, you're outside of it, and uh, it's almost out of reach and out of sight, yeah, right? Other than running away, yeah, which was a thought, right? Yeah. But the reality is, I, don't, I, I at that point in time, either I did not think it through all the way, or I, I assume my assumptions was that I cannot run a bullet, and it's still mm-hmm. if he still wanted to shoot me, would have. So I, I chose to go kinetic using the terminology. Uh, but all I did was pin the gun in his arm to his chest and start wailing at him till my rescue element yep. came over and, and, and that's he stopped. One of, yep, that's one of the things I emphasize. You don't need to be a samurai master. All you need to do is how to control that situation for about 15 to 30 seconds yep. and let the cavalry get there. Yep, And they got him to do a great job. But again, to your point, that was part of the pre-planning. And I think, being that it was a smaller agency in, you know, not a big metropolitan area, so their exposure to training and tactics is limited. I think the fact that I was there able to share, not to toot my own horn, but having that, just the pre-planning. I mean, we're limited resources. Mm-hmm. The, the whole agency was six officers. So and my, that's one of the, like, that's one of our ethos at Masada, right? Reaching those agencies, especially yeah. those agencies. Those are the ones that need the most. Yeah, absolutely. So it's always fun. Guys. So we're going to be in Indiana um, in two weeks. Quick. Yeah, it's going by quick. And we're actually going to do a two-day version of the class. Uh, but we're going to include a lot of information in that one. So we're going to do the uh, uh, restraint, defeat uh, element. We're going to do the defensive tactics. We're going to do the shooting. We're going to do the driving. I don't think we're going to get into the persona part of it. No. And depending on time, maybe no, officer we rescue. Might, we might touch on some basic stuff in the on our initial PowerPoint. But because it's still a condensed version, we want to get the really life-saving tools so right. that's what we're doing yep so if there's any agencies out there that is interested in training certainly uh reach out to us and let us know yeah it's i love teaching the class because it is life-saving information applicable information for more than just those scenarios and man it's so much fun yeah this everybody is, has so much it's a blast fun. yeah and and it the looks on people's faces because they're doing something that's so out of the ordinary <laughs> uh, that is, uh, it's worth. Yes, I've never in my life laughed so hard teaching a life-saving class, you know, than this. I probably have more pictures in my phone <laughs> yeah, from videos. that class than any other class. <laughs> I've, I've, yeah, you've almost made me thrown up as much as I've laughed. <laughs> I spoke to someone recently and mentioned, I think we're teaching this in Georgia and uh, we're doing the vehicle part, and then you closed the door. My thumb oh, was still yeah, there. I was making Georgia. Yeah, and I, uh, I, I, I like let him mm, out or something. Yeah, I freaked and out. You're I'm like, what? Chop your finger off. And you go, I just BK BK. <laughs> <laughs> I made him bleed his own blood. Yeah, nobody makes me bleed my own blood. Well, yeah. it was like weird. Like the door slammed on your hand, and you just went like, ah. And you left it there and you slowly removed it. You know, most people would be like, ah! <laughs> and you're like, oh. I didn't want to turn my thumb off. And you're like, dude, you close the door of my finger. I'm like, ah! I'm like oh my God. <laughs> and you're just like, I'm good. Let's go. <laughs> yep, no, we had to uh, show out to go on. Yes. Um, well, hopefully, uh, people heard this and at the very least understand that there's a need that they need to feel, if not through us, then somebody else, but certainly know that 
if you are in that capacity as a warrior or uh, even as an homeowner, if you yeah, yeah. Um, if you're concerned about home life. invasion, mm-hmm. yep, yeah, um, seek the tools that will keep you safer. That's Absolutely. the bottom line. Absolutely, protect what matters. Right? Protect what matters. Till next time, stay savage. Thank <laughs> you.